Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time here together this morning. And I, I thank you for men of God who are gripped with a passion to pray. And Father, I thank you that tomorrow there will be people all across this nation praying, gathering at the steps of our local and state government houses and praying and interceding for our nation. Father, I pray that you would birth within us a fresh and a new a passion to pray. But Lord, a passion to pursue the vision that you have given us as a church and as a nation to pursue you. And we pray this, that you would bless our time together here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I just want you to remember and give you a little context to, to Nehemiah. After 70 years of, uh, of captivity, the Jews go back to Jerusalem in three waves. Zerubbabel leads the first one. About 80 years later, a second group goes under Ezra. And then 13 years after that, Nehemiah goes back in an effort to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. As Nehemiah, he did this as he was moved with compassion for his people because he was driven to prayer. He prayed, God gave him a vision, and then he pursued it. So here Nehemiah shows up, and they had been there for a hundred years. They had been prone to, to raids and to, uh, to being intimidated and harassed by the surrounding nations and people. They are, the walls were a sense of identity and a sense of protection. And Nehemiah shows up, and he says, we're going to build the walls. Now, I have to imagine that there had been some others around there before that, you know what, might be a good idea if we build a wall. Oh, no, Grandpappy tried that. It didn't work out so well. We can't do that. But a man came with a vision that was birthed in prayer. And when you have a vision that is not something that you just get because you had pizza last night, but rather it's a vision that is birthed in seeking the face of God. It has staying power. And so Nehemiah, with this vision, was able to do something that had not been done for two generations. And that was to rebuild the walls, establishing the nation, protecting the people, and giving them a sense of worth, and the fact that they were God's people and his hand was upon them. There are some parallels to where we are today as a nation. Look, we have a system of government in which the people participate in. It's political. It's important. It's a part of who we are. But it does not define who we are or who we will be as a nation. I believe that God's fingerprint has been upon this nation from the very beginning. He has cast the vision for this nation through the founders. What we must do, what each generation must do, is as Nehemiah was disturbed by the distress that his people were in, the trouble that they were facing, he didn't try to create another political party. And I'm not knocking any of that stuff. But our first thing must be first, and that is to seek the face of God. He sought God on behalf of the people. It wasn't for himself. He was fine. He was in a good position. He was taken care of. His 401k was solid. But he was willing to leave all of that behind because of a vision. What is your vision for this nation? What is your vision for your family, your church, your business, your, your community? Unless that's first birthed in the prayer of God, we will not have the staying power necessary to pursue that vision. I just want you to see very quickly this. When, when God gives us that vision, when he gives you that vision, when you arise and you obey and you pursue that vision of God, as we see here from this passage, expect the enemy to arise and oppose. So don't think that this is going to be uh, easy skating from here. For, oh, we, we had an election, you know, we voiced our opinion, and, and it's, all, it's all done. When you arise 
and you obey and you pursue the vision that God has given you, expect the enemy to arise and oppose. And from Nehemiah, we learn to pursue a vision from the Lord. And as we do this, you've got to do four things. Number one, be mindful of the opposition. Sanballat and Tobiah, they were outright opponents. But even the Jews, the people of their own community, were naysayers. Oh, you know what? They said they're going to they're gonna stop us. This isn't a good idea, Nehemiah. I told you my granddad tried this. You must return to the vision. And it must be nurtured and preserved in prayer. You must be mindful of the Lord. Look what Nehemiah did every time he prayed. And we prayed to our God. Every time we're faced with the reality of the opposition, we must go back to the reality that we serve a God who is all-powerful. Paul in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. And we must be mindful of our responsibility. It doesn't stop with prayer. Prayer is the beginning. Prayer is where we gain the vision, but then we have a responsibility to carry it out. Nehemiah, realizing the threats, realizing the danger, realizing the opposition, took precautions, took the necessary steps, put the guard, set the guard, had the builders building with one hand and defending with the other. We have to be practical in pursuing the vision. It's not enough to stay in our prayer closet. You've got to make sure the hinges work on that prayer closet. You go in and you come out, and you go to work pursuing the vision that God has given. And then finally, we must constantly be reminding the people of the vision and what is possible. Again, I, I, I draw you back to, I'm sure there were skeptics when Nehemiah came onto the scene. I mean, you know, it wasn't like anybody ever thought of, that didn't think that there, could, there should be a wall. There was no one that had the vision from God to carry it forward. It wasn't like some far-fetched idea, but they just didn't think it was possible. Can we have a nation again that honors the Lord Jesus Christ and the principles of Scripture in our public policy? Some would say, oh, that man, that's, I don't know how you're going to do that. Well, guess what? If it were easy, anybody would do it. Any preacher could do it, any Christian businessman, any Christian politician, but it's not easy. It requires the power of God through working through his people who are dependent upon God. But will only, it will only happen when we have a God-sized vision that is birthed through a relationship of committed prayer with God. Friends, I think it's time we think big. I think it's time we have God's vision and we pursue God's vision for this nation. And I believe he's given us a small glimpse of what he can do just in the political realm that we saw in this last election. And the protections that we're going to be able to reestablish for religious freedom is going to give the church the ability it, ha it needs to do its mission of evangelizing men, women, and children in this nation. And it must be protected and advanced by a prayer force. And I thank you for your commitment to that. Let me just close with this, and I'm going to pr pray. I'm going to go back to my RV. I'm going to tell you a story. A few years ago, my family and I were going to, I got invited to go speak at uh, one of my favorite places in the, in the country, in Tennessee, in Pigeon Forge. And it was actually Answers in Genesis was having a, a conference, they asked me to come up and speak, so I told my family, I said, hey, why don't we just take a week and we'll, we'll go up there. We, we usually go there once a year anyway, so I said, well, we'll just drive the RV up there, we'll spend a, spend a week. And so it didn't take much to convince them, it was on the July 4th weekend, so we, uh, you know, we were driving up there. And, now, I'm, I define myself as a conservative. My wife defines me as cheap. Um, 
But an RV affords us the ability to stop at Walmart parking lots instead of getting hotel rooms when we travel. So we had stopped the first night. We were at a Walmart parking lot, and we head off the next morning, and we were going through a place called Cleveland, Tennessee. Anybody ever been there? Okay, all right. Well, we were going down the main highway, and, and all of us, I got five kids, they're all in there, and my wife and my oldest daughter was sitting on the front seat, and we were having a conversation, this has been about three, three years ago, about how the, you know, the politicians are destroying, destroying America, you know, typical family conversation. And um, <laughs> we, were, we, we were about to go under an overpass, and just as we were about to do that, my wife sticks her head up into the front. She, she points to a sign that was on the overpass, uh, but it was a little bit too late. The, the sign said uh, clearance 10 feet 6 inches. Uh, the RV was 12 foot 6 inches. Um, uh, we, we made it through. <laughs> At least most of us. <laughs> there was a part of the RV laying back there, but we, we, get, we get through and, you know, there's this screeching and scratching and dust and you know, you just at that point, you're, you don't know whether to, to laugh or cry. And so we get through the other side, and I'm stunned. And we're in traffic. The traffic is bad. I couldn't get over the side. My, my wife said, well, you know, keep driving. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm driving. There's cars, you know, blowing their horn next to me. And, you know, say, hey, hey, hey. You're like. So my wife says, we, we finally found a spot where we could pull off, and, and so I, I pull off. She goes, I'll, I'll get out and check to see how bad it is. I mean, I knew how bad it was. I could see daylight. And so <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we pull off, and, and she gets back in in 30 seconds. She says, it's bad. <laughs> so, you know, we're first, I mean, the first full day of a trip where we were going to be, I got to speak the next day and, uh, or the two days after that, and, and this is where we're going to stay. So I'm thinking, oh, man, what are we going to do? So uh, long story short, we, uh, we ended up uh, finding a place to take it to, and we had to leave it, and my parents were meeting us there. So we, we get a uh, U-Haul trailer, and uh, we look like the camp clampets, you know. We got everything piled in there, and we go on to uh, Pigeon Forge, and my, uh, my assistant found a, a hotel room. Now, this is something you don't want to try, trying to find a hotel room on July 4th weekend in Pigeon Forge. We got the last room in the city, I think, and it was at a pet hotel. It was horrible. You know, dogs screaming and uh, barking all night long. And that was on a Saturday night. Sunday morning I get up, and I was actually at that point I was also interim pastor. I'm kind of like the resident interim pastor at our church. And so first weekend I had had off in uh, probably three or four months. And, you know, I'm. this was kind of a, well, this is not the way you want to start a vacation, you know, taking the top off your RV. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking which, which child's not going to go to college in order for me to pay for this. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm out th that Sunday morning, uh, and I'm running, and I'm just kind of saying, God, you know, why did this have to happen? And I'm just so discouraged. And I, I go back in, I tell my wife, I say, let's just go home. I'll call them and cancel the speaking event, and we'll, let's just go home. There's no way we're going to have a good time. I mean, it's, it's horrible. So she goes, okay, well, let's go see your parents. They were staying at a condo with no dogs down the uh, street. So we go down, and uh, we're going to go visit them about 10 o'clock on that Sunday morning. And, and so we're driving down there, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, these uh, police cars start coming around us with lights on. And, and I'm thinking, and I, as Pierre said, I spent time in law enforcement. So I'm thinking, uh, Sunday morning, police cars, Pigeon Forge. I mean, what could possibly be happening in P Pigeon Forge? So... About that time, we pull onto a bridge to go up this hill, uh, and uh, we ended up getting stopped in this barricade that the police had set up on a bridge. And so I look to see what's happening, and I see that there's a woman out on the edge of the bridge getting ready to jump. Now, I also, I'm still involved in law enforcement and serve with one of the departments as kind of a chaplain. And so I, I told my wife and me, I said, I, I, let me just get out. You take, take the car. And, and I got out, and I, there was two uniform officers. The closer they got to the woman, she backed up on the bridge, about to jump off the bridge. And I said, they, of course, they stopped me, but I showed them my credentials. And they said, can you help us? I said, I think I can. Long story short, I spent about 45 minutes and, and, and talked this woman off the bridge. Her son had been in the Navy, and 
she was estranged from him and there was drug issues and just it, quite frankly what so many people are going through today and so she sat down on the curb I prayed with her and went to the hospital to, for her to be checked out and the police took me back to the condo where my parents were and my wife met me at the door she didn't say a word tears in her eyes she just hugged me but I knew exactly what she was saying aren't you glad we didn't turn around and go home there's going to be opposition to pursuing what God has given us as his vision there's going to be times we want to turn around we just want to give up we're not seeing the evidence of God working and moving and it doesn't add up and we want to give up and we want to go home and we just want to be left alone but could it be that this generation that those in this room and watching across the country that we're on the the verge of literally talking our culture and our country off the ledge and bringing America back to its founding vision as Paul said let us not grow weary in well-doing. Father, we, we thank you for your vision, for your vision that you have for your people, a vision to pursue you, a vision to put you first, a, a vision, Lord, to pursue you in everything that we do. And Lord, we know that nations rise and fall based on how they align themselves with you. And Lord, you gave our founders a vision for you, a vision for truth, a, a vision to pursue that which was righteous and true. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would birth first and foremost in us a desire to pray, a desire to spend time with you, to prioritize that in our busy schedules, in our busy lives. And Lord, as pastors, as business leaders, as political leaders, Lord, that you would take first priority in our lives. Not in words, in what we say and profess, but in the prayers that we pray and the time that we spend with you. And Father, I pray from that as you birth within us a heavenly vision, a divine, divinely inspired vision, that Father, we would then have the strength and the, and the endurance to pursue that vision. And may we often remind ourselves of who it is we serve. And Lord, let us not be sidetracked by the opposition. May we not become discouraged by the rubble and the debris that so often is found at a building site. But rather, may we be reminded of the vision and what is possible in and through you. Lord, I speak a blessing upon those gathered here today, these men of prayer. <coughs> Bless them, bless their families, bless all that they put their hands to as they put their hearts toward you and toward your vision. And Lord, may your blessing be upon the National Day of Prayer. And may they too continue to pursue the vision that you've given them that they have held for years. And may they not be distracted by opposition or obstacles. But Lord, may they keep before them that vision from you. I thank you for them. I thank you for their leadership. And I thank you again for our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, his Family Research Council's Executive Vice President. Would you welcome him, please? Thank you all. Thanks to all of you for being here, and uh, I'm only going to take a few minutes of your time here. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I, let me start by saying uh, you said that I teach at Hamden Sydney College. Uh, well, I did for 10 years, and Monday was my last day. I am, uh, they have fired me for the second time. <laughs> I'm not kidding. 
They have fired me because I've taken uh, a pretty uh, direct stance on uh, men going in women's bathrooms. And the, uh, the problem I have with that. And by the way, let me say that every man in America that either supports this directly as part of a state legislature or a city council or that supports it by not doing anything, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're part of the problem. If you won't stand against evil, Psalms 94 says, Who will rise up against this evil for me? Who will take a stand against these evildoers? And that is not talking to the secular world. That's talking to us. That's talking to us. That's just like Second Chronicles 7.14. It's talking to the church, my people. And we've got to stand up against this stuff. Now, so they fired me, they fired me last year. Uh, and eight days later, because of the reaction they got to it, they called me on the phone. I got off an airplane in Denver, Colorado, and the phone was blowing up. And the interim president of college said, what do I have to do to get you to come back so I can announce it today? But the reason was because the Christians that said, we're going to do something. They rose up against the school. And now, so they brought me back for a year, and now they're, they fired me again. So it's, it's, I was done as of Monday. But that's okay. I, I, I trust the Lord. And I, I put it before the Lord. And, and the first time, I actually questioned the Lord. I said, what are you, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? I know I'm in a bastion of liberals here, but I, it would seem you'd want me to, to be here. And eight days later, he showed me a miracle. Well, this time I put it before the Lord, and they fired me. But I still trust him. I still trust him. And that's the message that we've got to get out to people. You either trust God or you don't. And you either know that he's got a plan or, 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 or you don't believe that he's got a plan for your life. You don't believe that if you're willing and you're, you're willing to put yourself at his disposal and submit yourself to his authority, that he's going to answer your prayer in the way that best suits his purpose. And that is a hard message for us to get to the people that we influence. You see, in 1993, in Mogadishu, Somalia, the man right next to me during the Black Hawk Down events was killed. I was wounded. I went down. When I got to my feet, I was knocked out for just a second. I'd been hit in the feet and the legs by a mortar, and he was killed, and, and, and several others were, were wounded, some rather severely, and I, and I said, God, why did you take that man? Why didn't you take me? I said, why did you take that man? He's got young children. I, my children are grown. I said, uh, I'm ready to go. I don't know about him. Why did you take that man? And I never, I asked God that question so many times over and over. Why did you take him, Lord? Why didn't you take me? And uh, I never got an answer to that. So why did you take him, not me? I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't talk to my pastor. I didn't talk to my wife. I didn't talk to any of my buddies about it. And then I came to work at the Family Research Council in 2012. The summer of 2012, I came here after telling Tony no three times. In fact, I got, I got kind of huffy with him and said, What part of no are you struggling with, Marine? <laughs> See, Tony's a Marine. Which means he's, you know, he's persistent, but, you know, big words like no are not his forte. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. Just, he wore me down. And I finally said, I'll come up here. I came up here in July of 2012. Sitting up in my office on August 15th of 2012, and I heard three gunshots. Boom, boom, boom. How many of you have walked out there and seen the? Gunshots in that lobby. I went running down to the lobby. I saw Leo Johnson down, our building manager, down with his neck on the 
uh, his knee on the neck of a big man with a pistol laying in front of him and blood everywhere, blood everywhere. Leo had been shot through the arms. If you haven't seen the bullet holes, there's two of them out there. The third bullet went in his arm, but the others are out there in the library right now. And, and as I anticipated, <clears throat> what, I, what to do? Pick up that pistol and just go ahead and shoot this guy because we, I clearly would have been justified to do so. Leo's bleeding profusely. And by the way, this guy uh, later told the judge that he targeted us because we were a hate group, because we believed in biblical, natural marriage. We were a hate group, and he was from an LGBT group, and he came in this building to kill as many of us as possible. He had 100 rounds of ammunition with his Glock 9mm pistol and 15 Chick-fil-A sandwiches, which he said to the judge he was going to rub in the faces. And Tony and I were the primary targets, no question. I stood there contemplating what to do for just a moment, and the police came running in, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And the Holy Spirit said, This is why I spared you. This is why I spared you. I spared you to fight another day. I spared you for this fight. I prepared you for this fight. And I spared you there that day in Mogadishu so that you would be part of this fight because this is the fight that really counts. This is the fight for the soul of America. This is the fight for who we are as Christians. And I spared you to fight this. Now, now do what I've called you to do. You know what? I didn't see that in 1993. I had no idea. It never occurred to me that maybe I was spared for a reason Maybe it wasn't by coincidence. Maybe there was a reason that God spared me. And the truth of the matter is, if you go back and look at Jeremiah 51, 50, and you go to the ESV version, it says, For you have been spared from the sword. Now go. Do not stand still. Isaiah 51, 50, go. We've been spared from the sword, you know. Think about it. We have been spared from the sword. Now go. Go what? Go where? Wherever God leads you to do whatever God's called you to do. And that's a message we've got to get out to the people today because we've got a window of opportunity. You may have issues with Mr. Trump, but we've got a window of opportunity, and tomorrow at 11 o'clock, you'll at least see that he's trying to fulfill his campaign promises to us, the evangelicals that have, when he puts out this new executive order. Go, do not stand still. We've been spared from the sword, now go. Go and do God's message. That's the message we need to get to all these people that are just saying, well, I still don't know about it. Mr. Trump, hey, this is not about Mr. Trump. This is about a country that was ordained by God, and this is about us doing all we can as faithful Christians and prayer warriors to spare this country and underpin the leadership of this country so that he will have at least an opportunity to be successful. It's my privilege to spend a few minutes with you this morning. May the Lord bless you, and thank you.